Hello, welcome. I'm so happy to have as our guest today, Barbara Ireland. She is a filmmaker, a collage artist, a producer, a musician, a singer, and author of the book, How to Stop Negative Thoughts, What My Near-Death Experience Taught Me About Mind Loops, Neuroscience, and Happiness. Thank you so much for joining us, Barbara. I am so pleased to be here, Mary. Thank you. Okay, so I saw your talk about your near-death experience, which I definitely want to get into, which led me to buy your book and read your book, which I thought was phenomenal, and I'm still using it, which we'll get into afterward. But without a lot of delay, please tell us about uh, your near-death experience and how that came about. So I was working on a career as a singer at the time when I ended up going on tour with my friend Stone Gossard, who's one of the guitar players for Pearl Jam. And we were in our own separate band. We were touring and when this strange experience happened, we were in Brooklyn on stage and there was this man in the front row right in front of me who hated our show and was very body language clear about that. <laughs> and, and, you know, everyone else was having a great time. And of course, there's going to be someone that's not into it. We weren't Pearl Jam, you know, so, but for some weird reason, my being just connected to this man. And I couldn't seem to get him out of my mind. So while I am performing and acting like everything's normal and wonderful and I'm having such a great time, which part of me was, the other part of me was tuning into this man, watching this man and his really negative body language and wondering first, what's wrong with our band? Why do we, do we must sound bad tonight? And then quickly, what's wrong with me? Because he was standing in front of me and, you know, we are egos. It always is about us. <laughs> so the negative stuff went on me. And I was thinking, why am I even on stage with Stone? I can't sing, you know? So like basically mm -hmm. the worst downward spiral of thoughts about myself. And these started pouring into my head in a stream I had never heard in my life. Um, I had experienced depression and, you know, some anxiety, but mainly depression before. And still, I'd never quite heard them this way. It was like um, opening up a dictionary with lists of all the things that are wrong with me and someone just reading them out to me. I was like, oh my God, this is happening. And while that's happening, I'm acting normal and singing. And then a third part of my brain was behind me, so to speak, watching this, witnessing me do this and commenting also. And it was saying, well, oh, look how you can kind of split your attention in both these ways. And how look how you're doing all this. It's like, Oh my God, I can't wait for this show to be over. So finally it was over. That night I was laying in bed and I thought, what are these negative thoughts? Are they always in my head? How come I didn't hear them before? And how do I get rid of them? Because that was not helping my confidence or my happiness in the moment at all. And I had this so-called great idea that I was going to sign up for one of these kind of self-development boot camps of sorts where you they subject you to experiences that push your boundaries, but you develop courage. And I thought that'll that'll take care of any thoughts like that. I'll have so much confidence coming out of there. So I, I signed up for one. And months later I went. I semi dragged my best friend with me. It was in this very remote area of Vancouver, British Columbia. And it was outdoors, very far from anything. Uh, no 
well, actually, this was before cell phones, but even if, if there were cell phones, we would have been too far away to get a signal. And um, every day was terrifying. I knew I, I knew I signed up for terrifying, or I knew I'd signed up for scary, but I didn't know I was going to sign up for terrifying. And especially these certain days where big, scary men literally were there to frighten you so that you would know what to do if you were ever attacked. But they were basically attacking us. That's the most I've ever said about that piece. But anyway, um, it was not pleasurable, that part especially. And, but I was still getting through every day. And the last main day was an endurance experience, outdoors, in the sun. And by the way, it was sleep deprivation on top of everything. So this was, you know, my sixth day of three hours of sleep a night. So we were pretty out of it also. Um, so halfway through this endurance experience, I was fine the whole week until this moment. I started feeling really wobbly in my legs. I started seeing flashes of light. I started hearing very strangely where I would hear conversations far away, but the woman next to me, I couldn't understand what she was saying. It was all jumbled. And I realized something was wrong. And I thought, oh, I, I must be dehydrated. I'll drink more and more water. And all week I'd been sweating and drinking water. And the reason I bring that up is because what was happening to me was two things, heat stroke, and hyponatremia. I mean, all the health experts say, drink more water, drink more water. Well, I drink a lot of water. And guess what? My body does not hold sodium well enough so that if I drink too much water, it washes the sodium out. And like marathoners die sometimes because of this. If you're really pushing your body and you lose the sodium in your blood, your blood crash blood pressure crashes. So both heat stroke and hyponatremia can kill you. And I had both of them going on at once. Mm -hmm. The heat stroke creates a lot of the same symptoms as when you hear stroke. So that's why I was seeing things, hearing things really distorted because my mind was basically having a stroke. So I had these two things going on. I did finish the endurance challenge, which is shocking considering I wish I could convey to people what I was seeing and experiencing as I went through the finish line, because I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Jacob's Ladder, but there's this creepy head in it that wiggles back and forth it's nightmarish image and that's kind of what things looked like for me things were strobing and moving in weird ways and the sounds were going rah, rah. Was just so psychedelic <laughs> but not psychedelics um and so i told someone i'm going to faint please get me a medic and i sat down and they they didn't bring me anyone. They said just to rest. Well, eventually I kept asking for one. And this man approached who was so dear, but he was not a medic. He was what they called a medic. But shockingly, this place did not have proper medics. Uh, he did give me electrolytes, though. So I got some sodium back into my blood. Um, but he was terrified every time he took a new reading of my blood pressure and everything else. So he said, let's get you back to your tent and you can just rest there because no one thinks they're going to die. He didn't think I was going to die, I'm sure. Um, I mean, who's ever around people when they're dying? It's so rare. How do we know we're dying? I didn't know, but I found my, my best friend found me. And she was 
terrified when she saw me because my skin was gray, um, just vacant eyes. I couldn't walk. Uh, anyway, they took me back to the tent. It was too hot to be inside. So I laid under this gorgeous tree. And each one of my limbs started disappearing from my, um, I mean, I don't even know what was going on with them. They just, they didn't exist anymore. I couldn't move them. I couldn't feel them. All I could feel was that I was a head and a torso, and I was just kind of locked there on the ground, very helpless and frighteningly vulnerable. And I was practically screaming that my limbs were leaving. <laughs> and at that point, that's when it started getting really fascinating and mystical because I was feeling this air going out of the top of my head, which I understood even a little bit then, but way more after I started looking into near-death experiences, I understood that to be my life force was leaving the top of my head. And I thought, oh, this, this isn't good. <laughs> and a movie began playing and it was, not like, and, and I'd say a movie, my eyes are closed. So it's a movie, I think they were closed anyway, playing in my head, but not like a memory, not like a visualization someone might do. It was like being in that moment, identical to like reliving it. But I was reliving it like I could feel what I felt then hear everything um, like I was sitting there where I was sitting but I was also watching it at the same time there were these two perceptions going on at the same time and it was a band rehearsal with it I was in another band with my brother and it was from a couple weeks earlier and we had gotten into a conflict so it was replaying this moment and suddenly this movie of sorts freeze framed at just this moment where I was looking at him with this certain look on my face and a voice, internal voice I'd never heard before, a male voice, very calm, said, what were you thinking at that moment? And me laying there under the trees, thought about it and answered. And as soon as I answered that movie went off my screen and a new one, it's like they would come in from my right side and start playing again. And then this one was from a few weeks earlier. And then again, it free frame, freeze framed at this moment, I lifted my eyebrow. What was I thinking? that caused me to lift my eyebrow. That's what it asked me, the same voice. I answered, it went away, another one. And it was interesting, a lot of these tiny moments in conversations stopped at body language, like putting my head down, crossing my arms, looking away, maybe a sigh, um, just, it's really interesting. These little tiny moments that appear on the body have, are, are revealing in a sense, this crazy world going on in the head of everybody <laughs> walking around, which is really interesting to me. We're all walking in these different worlds from each other. So, um, this continued for several hours. And I later understood this was my life review or a life review. It never went into my childhood, for instance, for, for some reason, but it all, and it always, this voice always asked about my thoughts, few times about my emotions, but they were also always connected to thoughts. And at the end of these two hours or three or actually, when I thought about it later, I think it's four hours, the way the sun was, um, 
I was suddenly given this question, Barbara, you get to decide now, or you have to decide now, would you like to stay or go? And I knew, because all this time during this life review, my life energy had been moving through my head. And I knew at this moment, it was meaning, do you want to continue dying? Or do you want to go back to full life? And I was leaning towards dying because the feeling on that side is not something that we know here, as far as I can tell. I've never felt it, and I don't know anyone else who has felt it. It's the most extraordinary sense of love. Um, it's not even like what we use that word for. It's like that, but so, so much bigger and so much more amplified of love and so encompassing. It's like it's in every cell of the body. It's in the very air, whatever that may be over there, that one breathes. And what was going on is I had one foot in death and one foot in life at that moment. I was basically on a threshold between the two worlds and I could feel both of them. And of course I knew life well. I thought if I come back to life, there are so many freaking hassles over here. <laughs> I mean, there's money issues, relationship issues, health things to deal with. There's like, uh, there's just so many things. I mean, the reason I was at this camp, like, do I really want to deal with all that again? Or do I want to go there? That is full of love, unconditional love, kindness, welcoming, ease, non-judgment, just amazing support. And I was leaning that way, but I asked questions of this guide who had been working with me on this life review. And through that conversation, um, I decided to go back. And one of the most important things I wanna point out is through that conversation, I was told and I understand that the most important thing that we have to do here on this earth is awaken to our own love. How we show up in relationships, in our work. Um, it's so interesting. Like if, if we, people talk about how do I ascend and how do I open myself spiritually? And how do I raise my vibration? It's all about how much can you love more? How much can you quit resenting these people? When are you going to forgive? I know forgiveness is not easy. I'm not saying that flippantly. But honestly, if people want to expand and grow and really be here for a reason, then start working on opening your heart. So uh, that's more than what this guide said, but I've been thinking about it over the years and there's so much more I could say about love. But basically uh, I was told if I go back, I need to contact these four people. And one is two of them were to repair a relationship. One was to express gratitude. And the other one was to, and all of them basically was to express love. And so I agreed. And I, it said, I have to do that the following week. First week I'm back. And I agreed. The moment I said I wanted to come back to my life, I felt the life force reverse its direction and start going back into my body. And I could feel it moving in the top of my head and almost kind of like there was a cylinder or something in the middle of my body and it was going through like a pipe and then dispersing as it went through the body or something. And each of my limbs came back and I opened my eyes 
And by then, like I said, the sun had come down um, to this incredible, you know, the magic twilight hour. The colors were beautiful. And this it, that began a whole month of seeing life from brand new fresh eyes where I, I just, I mean, we're so in our heads. We miss out on the extraordinary beauty that is constantly around us. Even in ugly areas, there's things that are beautiful if we just notice them. I mean, in a really crummy part of town in LA, for instance, I saw this beautiful dandelion push up from the cement. Um, and I was just like blown away by life that just wants to be born and live even in a crummy cement with litter everywhere. Anyway, back to the story. So, um, a month after that experience, I started hearing my negative thoughts again, because during that month, I was in this state of bliss where for once I was free of that inner dialogue that was saying I wasn't good enough, um, not talented enough, not pretty enough, um, worrying constantly about somebody, uh, you know, just on and on and on, resentments from the past, fears of the future, all that started coming back in. I was on antidepressants for years up to this moment, or continued for a little after that. And I thought, oh, okay, this is really bad. I've been through a near-death experience. I wasn't sure if that's what it was then yet, but um, it was starting. I mean, when you have these things, you're not really sure what the heck just happened. But uh, I went through that crazy, weird experience, the camp therapy, like what the F is going on? And I sat down at that moment and thought, what was the common denominator of all the questions I was asked during that experience? And that's when I realized every single one pretty much was about my thoughts. So I thought, what is, what's that mean? What's that telling me? Well, clearly the message was about my thoughts. And then when I realized they were all negative thoughts, worries, fears, anxieties, um, self-doubt, jealousies, anger, all of these thoughts, I now understand were creating the life that I was living in. And this is the big message from my near-death experience. There is this massive, very potent relationship between the thoughts we think and our outer reality to the point where you could say you are creating this. And even if you don't want to go that far, okay, so things are happening out there, but how do I respond to it? How do I react? to it? How do I think about that? Because whatever I think and respond in my mind about what's happening out there is going to affect me, my outlook on life, my brain chemistry, my emotions, what I do in this world. And so uh, I decided at that point to start studying brain science and thoughts. Where does depression come from? What is anxiety? What are the spiritual traditions that talk about uh, thought and the power of thought? What about manifesting? Does that really work? And I had evidence in the past it had, but I wanted to understand that better. And why are some, some things come through and why do some not? So I embarked on uh, three years of, um, I mean, not, not in a college study, but 
I guess you'd say informal or layman's study in neuroscience, cellular biology, the spiritual stuff. And I was practicing all these different techniques on myself to see if I could switch the way I think uh, in my head and this internal thinking process. Um, what I discovered during that time, I've discovered so much. One of the main things was that there's a difference between a negative thought that comes and goes, which we all have, and the ones that I call mind loops that come and then they stay. <laughs> they don't come and go, they come and stay. And they loop over and over and over and over and over. And worry especially was mine. I could worry about something till the cows come home. And I think mean, worries, there was Penn State did a universe, uh, Penn State University did a study on worry and they found that 85% of our worries don't even happen. And the other 15% may not happen the way we thought or to a way lesser degree, but 85% of the hell I bring on to myself and worry isn't even going to happen. And yet I'm altering my experience of life by doing that. So when I realized that, I thought, okay, I need to break these loops because once I break the loop, I can move on. It's like a regular negative thought that comes and goes again. And so I started developing a method that I now call the de-looping method. It's so simple to do, but you have to remember to do it. Um, but it breaks that loop. And as I started breaking that loop, number one, I was off antidepressants. I mean, that's huge for anyone that's on antidepressants. It's possible. I'm not saying they're wrong or bad or anything. They really helped me. But wow, I, I don't need them anymore. And I haven't for years and years and years now. Because this happened in 2010. So I think around 2011 or 12, I stopped that. And um, my health got better. I look really different. My body shape is even different. Um, my abundance started happening, like financial abundance. I was like, this is amazing. How are these things happening? Um, relationships really quickly improved. That was probably the fastest shift I saw. And my level of what I deemed to be the height of happiness continued to rise, which tells me, I believe now that happiness has a glass ceiling. I don't think that there is a limit. And um, yeah, things can get really harsh and really difficult on this plane of existence. It doesn't, I'm not saying you're happy all the time if you de-loop. But there's a tool then for when these difficult things do come up that we don't get locked in and then just crash and burn with them. So that's what I developed because of my near-death experience. And my whole feeling towards it has expanded um, to all sorts of other things like the connection between a cluttered mind and a cluttered home or vice versa. When the home is cluttered, how does that affect the mind? How does that affect mind loops? And if you declutter the home, how does that change um, the way you think about yourself, about other people, about hopes and dreams? It's just remarkable. So that was a big, long description, <laughs> Mary. I, I appreciate it so much. I, I, honestly, I was just enthralled listening to you. And um, I, I would like to share my experience with your book, if, if oh, that's good. okay with you, and how it, how it affected my life. Again, uh, Barbara Ireland is my guest. Her book is How to Stop Negative Thoughts, What My Near-Death Experience Taught Me About Mind Loops, Neuroscience, and Happiness. 
And the reason I think this is so especially important right now, Barbara, um, anyone who knows me or has listened to any of this, I am the biggest cheerleader for women and have, have believed for most of my adult life that the healing of this world will come about through women, but we have to heal ourselves first. I can remember being small and watching my aunts and my mom and everyone and thinking, they do so much. And it's like, nobody appreciates them. They, they don't appreciate themselves, their means. Like, I remember having those thoughts. So it's kind of my quest to heal that. And I have to start with myself because I, I am right in the same group as everyone else. So I, I want to share a little bit. I, I've shared um, before uh, on the podcast, but so I was I was raised in, in a home. There was a lot of love. Um, both my parents are past now. I was able to take care of both of them before they died. There was so much healing and forgiveness, but there was alcoholism in my home. So there was a lot of violence, a lot of abuse, and almost a daily basis of some kind of abuse, if nothing else, verbal for sure. And I ingested that, ingested that. When you said you noticed those thoughts on the stage and like where these come from, I was like, wow, you mean you had a period where they weren't in there? Because <laughs> I was aware of them my whole life, but was able to overcome them. It kind of surprises me that I could achieve what I achieved when I had this cesspool of just negativity and, and, and really pain and sorrow in there that was very much pushed down. And so... Um, I've spent decades, uh, I, I've said this before, I'll share it really quick. Uh, I was very traditionally religious, Catholicism, 12 years of Catholic school. Uh, I, I taught religion. I went to Bible studies. I, everything with me was religion. It came from a good place, a desire to be close to whatever God was that I believed at that point. But I only looked within the confines of Catholicism. That was what I knew. In my mid-30s, my kids were 10 and 16, and we lost their dad like that in a car accident. So I started going to a silent chapel, and in that chapel, everything inside of me started changing, and I, and I, I walked away from traditional religion um, and started finding my own way. So I have been on, for, for a few decades now, since my mid-30s, um, trying to find answers. And I've read a ton of self-help books and I, you know, everything, everything, everything I could get my hands on spirituality, how to heal this, how to heal that therapy, uh, retreats in treatment centers, whatever to heal, heal, heal all this trauma. And so a couple of years ago, I just said, I'm done reading how to books. If it says how to not interested. Um, but for some reason, I was really, I, I loved what you said. And more and more, I am becoming aware of the power of our thoughts. Anyone who listens to anyone who had a near-death experience, I've heard this so many times that people who cross over during their near, and they say, what were you thinking? So there is something to that, the, the power of our thoughts. And, and I have an extra question that I'll ask afterward. But anyway, so what I have found, your process has helped me. I, honestly, I'm so grateful for you because this torturous mind of mine, for so long, I was putting frosting on garbage. It's fine. It's fine. I'm going to do affirmations. I'm going to, you know, but it, I was still stuffing it down. And I truly do believe part of the healing, especially for women, we've got to bring that up. We've got to feel it. We've got to cry it out. We've got to feel the sorrow. Um, and then the healing can begin. And, you know, it really pissed me off because I just wanted to do the affirmations and like, okay, I know this now. I didn't want to have to deal with this deep, deep grief, but you know, there's no getting around it. If you really want to heal and you want to be whole, you got to do it. And, and, and you don't even have to go searching for it. You just have to allow it. And I want to share this with you. So I've been doing your exercises um, in the past year or so. I have been, I've also done some plant medicine ceremonies, which I've, I've shared um, on the podcast before that I found really helped bring up the deep stuff that was really buried in there. Um, so I, I, I've been using the methods that you talk about in your book. And one in particular really sticks with me. I use that, the, the switching, because it is, it, you know, this isn't just airy fairy. This is scientifically proven about the neurons that fire together, wire together. And, you know, we have to kind of retrain our brains. 
So I was using that, but but here's the thing, and I told you, so now I'm going to confess this to you. When I said, I'm sorry I didn't text you uh, or email you yesterday, because usually before a guest comes on the day before, you know, I just kind of check in and all that. And I didn't do that because what's been happening to me is, especially in the last few months, I'm hit with such deep sorrow that I can barely function. But here's the thing. I I would never let myself cry. And that's from something from my childhood. I won't go into now, not because I'm embarrassed. I just don't want to take a lot of time. But anyway, so I've had to allow myself to cry all these uncried tears and feel all this trauma that I buried and, and was very afraid of. And man, does it come. But the difference is, is I say to myself now, it's okay. I've got you. I know this hurts. I, I'm not going to leave you. I don't know exactly where this is leading, but I'm doing my best to be my own best advocate. So yesterday was one of those days where just from the depths of my soul, this, this, these old sorrows were coming up, coming up. And, and I just had to let myself, I just cried and sobbed all day and just had to keep saying, I'm here. I'm here. I'm not going to beat you up about this. I'm not going to tell you, you shouldn't feel it or make yourself ashamed because I've gone through this enough. And this is where what you've done has helped me so much. And so then I let myself do that yesterday. And then today I woke up and I said, you're still a little reverb, but I was like, okay, now today I'm going to start practicing again because I want to make sure I'm done. I don't want to stuff it. I'm like, okay, that, that was for yesterday. Now I need to go back to retraining my brain out of this, this loop of, of negativity and, 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 well, you know, I don't have to really go into that. Most women do know about that uh, never, never good enough loop. And we did everything wrong. So, um, and today, now I say, okay, now I'm going to do the practice again that, that you shared with me because I'm not avoiding the pain anymore. I'm not, I, I'm allowing the pain to process as it needs to, but also my, my brain is still, those neurons are still kind of stuck together. So now I want to retrain uh, my brain and get back to the practices that, um, you know, you, you learned and, and that you shared. So I, I do want to say thank you so much for that. And, and if you want to, I don't know how you feel, if you want to talk a little bit about the processing of feelings and without burying them and, you know, what you learned on the other side when they were asking you, why were they asking you, what were you thinking does it have to do with our feelings, our thoughts? Are we? I guess, I'm sorry, I'm kind of going around. This is what I really want to ask you, Barbara, because I don't even know. I would just like your, your opinion on this, because I think that's what we can do as women is just say, this is what I believe. This is what works for me. Take what you like, leave the rest, see what fits and what doesn't. Because there are really two, even in new age, there are, or, or more open-minded spirituality, that's not traditional religion. There is, you wake up in the morning, you think about what you want to manifest. You focus on that, whatever. And then there's also the thought process of you're just kind of floating on a river. Just whatever comes, you just just accept it or whatever. And I'm just, I'm really curious what your thoughts are, what your belief system is. Are we thinking and manifesting our lives or are we just kind of on this ride down this river and just kind of accepting whatever comes along? What a cool question. Um, I'm not really even sure how I'm going to answer. I'm just going to start talking. <laughs> um, the second aspect, the one you're saying where you uh, accept what's going on. To me, I think one of the biggest skill sets we can learn is um, what I call surrender or acceptance. And that's because there's this part of us that thinks we can control all sorts of things, which is what worry is about. It's like, if I can pre in advance, figure out every single problem that could go on in this one area and worry about it and work it out. So I'm prepared and in control of this bad thing I don't want to have happen, I'll be okay. But the fact is, 
I mean, I was worrying about another person's life. I have zero control over another person's life or about war and politics and climate change and if my manager's going to raise my rent. I mean, like from the big things to the little thing. We, we don't have very much control about a lot of things from one point of view. And so if I accept what happens, which is a real if, because I have to remind myself again and again and again, this is what's happening right now. Whether I have created it with my thoughts or not, this is what's happening right now. Uh, and I, if I accept that and quit pushing against it with, that shouldn't be happening. Well, the fact is it is happening. So if I'm not re, re, um, resisting it and adding energy and focus to it and feeding it, then I can actually start working with it, whatever the problem is. So if someone gets, um, let's say someone's diagnosed with, with um, pre-diabetic, and they're like, no, not me. I eat healthy. How could this be? This is impossible. It can't be happening. It's like, how's that helping? And oh, then, yeah. And so you just go, okay. So now I have a diagnosis of pre-diabetic. What's next? What can I do next? And how can I start thinking about it? I can resist with my thoughts or I can work with it. And then you start seeing what is in your control. You can change your diet, you can pick medicine, whatever you do. Um, and you can start, for instance, on the other aisle that you were talking about, manifesting your outer life and thus this pre-diagnosis, pre-diabetic pre di diagnosis, um, by feeling into it different, looking at it differently. There's a, um, the fourth D of my de-looping process, which you know, is de-story, pulling the story out of the thing that's happening. So the story a lot of people with that diagnosis would say is that shouldn't be happening to me. Um, I'm gonna get sick and die or have insulin injections or whatever. It's not necessarily true. Um, that um, something's, you know, this, well, whatever, whatever those thoughts might be. We could also look at it as something like that, maybe it's here to help me. Because maybe, I mean, they say sugar feeds cancer. What if I have a really minute, maybe one cell of cancer in me, and everyone has cancer cells, it's just that they're not growing. What if that one little cancer cell, if it gets fed a bunch of sugar, it's going to explode? And so this diagnosis is stopping me from eat, eating sugar, which is going to stop a cancer. Like, wow, I, I love that. that. Yeah. Isn't that wild? Yeah. yeah. That's and then from, a, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, there is a, a theory people say, instead of why is this happening to me? What does this come to give me? What does this come to show me? What gift is in this? Which it's very easy to say. <laughs> And I know how difficult it is, but when I can reach that place and say, you know, Byron Katie, I don't know if you're familiar with her work, oh, yeah. but yeah, her, she says, when you argue with reality, you lose every single time, right? The shit, <laughs> That's shit, a good quote. Right? Yeah. So uh, why is this happening? And so I guess the thought process comes in into changing our thoughts to, to more expansive and saying, what what does this this have for me? And, and I think your your analogy just with the diabetes and the cancer is is brilliant. That makes it makes perfect sense. There's so much we can't see. 
And that's one thing that a, a lot of people who have near-death experiences say is on the other side, you can see how everything's connected. Everything is connected. <laughs> and, and I remember during one um, uh, sacred uh, plant medicine ceremony I had, I, I was like underneath everything. And I, I kept going, oh, oh, like I could see why all these things were happening. You know, it, it does take trust, but I think the more we um, focus on, I hate to say work because I do believe we are ushering in an era of divine feminine energy, which has been sorely missing. And I do believe the divine feminine is just so gracious, so gentle, but powerful, very powerful. She doesn't chase after anything. She doesn't freak. She knows. She just knows everything she needs just just comes to her. And when we can sit in that knowing as she wakes up inside of all of us and start trusting that, that's that's the ball game right there. That's the ball game. And, and I do, uh, I, I so appreciate the tools. And again, I, I want to say the, the whole title, Barbara Ireland, her book is How to Stop Negative Thoughts, What My Near-Death Experience Taught Me About Mind Loops, Neuroscience, and Happiness. And she's telling the truth. Um, the methods are very simple, uh, but incredibly effective and powerful. I have found them to be. And like I said, I have been doing this for many, many years and have tried all kinds of different things. A lot of them were helpful, but this was like uh, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And this is really helping me to because this this is where it all is. Our thoughts, you know, we're we're so led to believe it's like we wake up and say, What's happening today? How am I going to feel? Instead of, this is how I choose to feel today. These are the thoughts that I choose to hold on to. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of practice because we don't have a lot of support out there. But the more we have conversations like this, the more support there will be for us for these new ways of existing in this world. Hundred percent. And and the emotions. I mean, we may have emotions that come really fast and then trigger thoughts, but I think, at least in my own experience, usually it's the thought triggers the emotion. Mm -hmm. And it's if you think about it, thoughts are causing actual brain chemistry to happen. And brain chemistry creates different emotions, which is like, like they say it takes, well, gosh, I don't want to go down this line too hard, but um, so if we start changing our thoughts, our emotions are going to be different. And that's why you can really start feeling better quickly by doing these steps. Even the first three that are really fast, as long as you can catch yourself in a loop, um, that takes some practice. But once you do, as you know, it's like you feel different mm -hmm. fast because you're actually creating different brain chemistry, which makes your whole body different. Your, um, your blood is different. So of course you're going to start feeling better. And, and like, like you said about emotions, that's the second phase of the de-looping process. And that's not outlined in the book because one book for each phase, probably I'll, I'll eventually write that book. Um, but I teach that in workshops and, but basically the, the idea, like you said, allow the emotions to come up. The problem is we push these things down. We don't want to feel sorrow and anger and grief and resentment and all this stuff it's just not that fun like you said you start crying mm -hmm. and stuff but who cares go and do it get it out of the body that's one way that I love another way is EFT tapping I don't know if you've ever done that yeah, yeah I have it's amazing mm -hmm. and I was I was Years ago, I, I did the emotion code. I forgot about it until yesterday it came up in a podcast. And that man's technique is very helpful too. It just starts clearing these pockets of emotion 
out of us so we aren't being triggered so our thoughts aren't being triggered in the outer world because we have these old emotions stuck in the body i know that that probably requires more description but i'll just leave it at that <laughs> I, honestly I, I could talk to you for hours i, I hope <laughs> you come back again and and we can continue this discussion so thank you so much for being here and can you please just tell everyone uh about you, where where they can find out more about you and your work? Yeah, so my website for this kind of work is howtostopnegativethoughts.com. My other website is barbaraireland.com, and that has both the mind loops work and the music on it. And then um, I don't know when this is coming out, but as I mentioned, there's a connection between decluttering and delooping. And I'm going to be doing a 30 day decluttering, de looping um, challenge starting May 1st. Oh, so this will be out in the next week or so. Oh, so, good. So maybe yeah. people will want to join because it's going to be so fun. <laughs> okay, I love that. Barbara, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Mary. I really enjoyed talking with you. Same here. Take care. Bye.